And we are streaming live. Give us one second here. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. My name is Angelette Aviles, and I'm here representing Americans for Prosperity Foundation. Also with me is Valeria Martinelli, who will be our panel moderator for tonight. He is our education policy expert who will talk us through the ways Americans for Prosperity Foundation approaches K-12 education and innovation. And I also want to thank you all for responding to our invitation to join us today for this important discussion on education. It's also an honor to be here today um, with some amazing individuals who will be sharing with us their point of view on education. Um, and you know, just a little bit about our, our nonprofit organization. We have been around for over 20 years, um, creating real change at the local, state, and federal levels by educating and training Americans to be advocates for freedom. Across the country, our programs and events allow us to share knowledge and tools that encourage participants like yourself to work towards finding innovative solutions to remove barriers within the four key institutions of society in education, business, community, and government. Now, sometimes to change the hearts and minds of people, it takes a story or a video like you're about to see or simply a conversation like we're about to have. Thus, here we are today to learn from each other so that we can stand together and share our knowledge and resources to make an even greater impact. So we encourage you to engage with us via the chat feature below. In addition to a survey, we'll be sending to you all for some feedback. Once again, thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to join us today. And now without further ado, let's kick it off with a very short video we have for you. So just wait here for one second while I share my screen and we'll get started. Many families like mine wonder what the future of education will look like. How will students learn? And will the job of educators change over the next 10, 50, or 100 years? To understand the future, sometimes it's useful to take a look at the past. Here's what a classroom looked like in the late 1800s. And here's what your typical classroom looks like today. Do you notice something that stands out between these two pictures? Hmm, they look almost exactly the same. This is no accident. In more than 100 years, the way we teach children has not fundamentally changed. Yeah, of course, a great many things have changed in the way schools work. But at the most basic level, the way we deliver education is still modeled after a very old and outdated system where standardized content is delivered to students in a standardized way. Here's the problem with that model. Children aren't standardized. As a mother of three, I can attest how uniquely and wildly different each child can be from the very start of their lives. So why are we comfortable with a system that denies their individuality and unique potential? <laughs> Students, families, and educators should be able to work together on solutions that are individualized to benefit each student while being freed from standardized systems that force all students to learn the same standardized content at the same pace. Many aspects of our lives have been transformed and allow for customization while leaving out what is arguably the most critical component to the future of our society. Why is that? Our entire kindergarten to 12th grade education system is built upon a standardized model. And we understand it's hard to transform large systems, but it's possible. Here's the good news. We now see a growing number of families and educators who are realizing that if the goal of education is allowing every kid to discover their unique talents and live a life of fulfillment, there is no legitimate rationale to preserving an outdated system of standardized education. And there is ample evidence that families and educators 
are hungry for more diverse solutions to build a strong foundation for all ages. What we know is that for a more personalized education to happen, we need an environment where many solutions are possible. An environment where experimentation and discovering what works for each individual student is encouraged. An environment where there's no longer institutional barriers preventing parents and innovators from revolutionizing how education works in our country. Ultimately, only when families are allowed to choose from many different options can we see real individualization take hold. Today, most families don't have access to such an environment. Education is one of the most highly regulated areas of our lives. The government imposes regulatory barriers that prevent social entrepreneurs from coming up with better ways of delivering education. However, lately we have begun to see transformation. We know all people have extraordinary potential and that every single one of them has unique needs and unique talents. But in many ways, our current system denies students their individuality. It denies them the chance to discover the world the way that makes the most sense to them. Embracing innovation in education means that students receive a customized education that prepares them for lifelong learning, where they are continuously developing and applying their aptitudes to create value for themselves and for others. In order to do that, we need to create new systems that allow students to customize their educational pathway. The stakes are too high. It is time to embrace a student-centric, innovative approach to education that empowers every family with the opportunity to personalize their education. If you're a parent, student, or educator looking for solutions to break out of the standardized model, join our efforts at Americans for Prosperity Foundation. Let's work together to inspire each other to overcome the barriers that stifle innovation in education and unleash everyone's full potential. Give us one second. I hope everyone can hear us. I'm just waiting for Valeria to come on screen. Let me turn on my camera and I, uh, let's see. <clears throat> I think Angela, you have to turn on the camera. <laughs> I got <laughs> you. There we go. Now awesome. Welcome, Valeria. Ready to thank kick you. it off? And welcome, everyone. Thank you, Angela. And thank you for all for being here. I really appreciate your willingness to share your thoughts on these very important topics. So thank you in advance to our panelists for today. So in line with what we've seen in the video, I think it's helpful to remember that education is one of the most significant ways in which government has the potential to touch people's lives. At an AFP foundation, we think that today more than ever, it's time to foster a conversation on how we can make sure that we can unlock the students' extraordinary potential for a new type of approach that is more rooted in customization and personalization instead of standardization, like we have seen in the video. As I'm sure many of you have noticed recently with this pandemic, this conversation has reignited a debate on where education is today and where it should be headed, heading. And obviously there are many different voices in this debate with very different perspectives. However, at AFP Foundation, we espouse a vision for education where bottom-up solutions are built so that all students can discover, develop, and apply their innate gift to maximize their ability to contribute to society. And achieving this goal, we believe, requires an individualized approach as opposed to the standardized way of doing education that we're familiar with today. As we've seen in the video, 21st century learning can no longer be a one-way lecture from a teacher to a student, nor should it be a rigid trajectory program to steer students from elementary school to college and work. We believe that today's educators must keep students of all ages and stages of life with the resources that they need and guidance to forge their own path of discovery and development. But as a starting point, I would like to begin with this. 
as you know, public, publicly funded primary and secondary education is guaranteed in all 50 states constitutions. But these provisions do not necessitate a one size fits all system of schooling that is resistant to innovation. So the question is that why haven't, why haven't we seen a substantial remake in education consistent and proportional, for example, with how innovation has changed many other areas of our lives? Why hasn't customization made more inroads in the traditional education space? space? From our end, when talking to our activists, edu educators, and families, it is often clear that education should start with the recognition that every person is unique with different aptitude, aptitudes, passions, and goals. At AFP Foundation, we believe that tapping in the unique combination of qualities is the secret to unlocking the extraordinary potential that exists within all of us. Families and educators today deserve diversity of solutions responsive to the need of every student. So this forum, in summary, this forum is an attempt to bring together individuals to share their stories about what's possible if we allow teachers and families, and educators and families to pursue solutions that meet the needs of individual students. And with that, I would like to start with a question director, directed to our educators here today. Uh, but first, let me introduce our panelists. So today with us, we have Rod Hames, who is a middle school public educator who has found innovative ways to spark his students' entrepreneurial spirits. So I wrote. And we have Fran Thompson, a public high school education entrepreneur who is translating her success in and out of the classroom as an educator of the year into empowering other educators in their own innovative approaches in teaching, learning, and business. And with us, there is also Jamie Franz, a working professional and parent who has incorporated virtual home and micro schooling to find the unique approach for our children and how they learn best. Before we begin, let me just remind you that our viewers can submit comments and questions in the chat feature below. So this is the first question for our educators. The recent pandemic has disrupted education for millions of students and their families. It's posing them to a myriad of new challenges which they're still trying to tackle. Do you think this situation has put a renewed focus and maybe a newfound appreciation for the work of teachers? Have you seen a silver lining coming out of the current challenge that educators and families are experiencing? Who wants to be first <laughs> for our educators? I can really answer that for a um, question. I definitely see how um, the pandemic has brought on its challenges with education, but what I, the beauty of, of it is that I have definitely seen um, more partnership uh, with parents, um, community leaders, business leaders, um, some more support to help educate our students. And so I have been able to tap into that power of partnership and deliver an experience virtually with my students um, by obtaining resources that I wouldn't have been able to have being in the education bubble, I was able to go outside and find things that the corporate world are using that I can apply in the classroom and make that experience better for our students. So definitely the power of partnerships has um, brought in uh, great benefits for my students in our school and community. That's great. Could you um, speak a little bit more about what do you think? What do you think are innovative? So, for example, what could you give me more example about, about what do you think is innovate innovation during these times? So, an example of how can, can we leverage innovation to help students? Um, you leverage innovation with uh, with your students definitely with some of the programs that you're using. Um, one of the things that I was able to do um, once we got into the pandemic, I was able to collaborate with another company to use a program called um, Icebreaker to create kind of a virtual networking experience that we would have never been able to tap into. I, I, I didn't even know about it until I was able to reach out to other people asking for help. And so 
I think you, you saw a lot of that, teachers reaching out to different corporations, different business partners to figure out what tools can I use in the classroom to deliver an experience for, my, for our kids virtually. Because, you know, the kids are on Zoom and on Google Hangout, but they needed more. They needed more mm -hmm. to enjoy um, education. And so I was able to do that by reaching out to our community partners. Yeah. And, and it seems like there is a variety of tools that we can use, but oftentimes the difficult thing is navigating them, is trying to find out which is, which is the one that is effective. Yes, true. And I just say, you just gotta be a risk taker and go out there and try different things. Some will work out and some may not, but just take that risk. Do the other panelists want to add to this, uh, trying to tackle this question? Jamie, uh, ladies first. <laughs> well, so we definitely had to innovate at home and transform how we did education. And so from a parent perspective, we looked outside the box on how can we bring the classroom to our children and still stay within the model of which they were learning in as well. So there was um, a plethora of information out there. It just took a lot of research on our part to find those programs and then innovate on our end. Yeah, yeah I, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go I was ahead. just gonna, fin I was gonna say that um, finding the, the right tools is the key and having uh, uh, a place where you can test it out is just ideal and that's what really uh, really was a thrilling part of what I was doing is I was able to test out different things. I used different programs together to see which mixed and matched and, and work well. And the students are just uh, willing to test this technology. They're, they're living and breathing it all the time. So it was really um, invigorating, honestly, for me as a 30-year veteran, um, I, I'm always looking, how, do I, how am I not going to burn out, right? So what is it new? What's innovative that I can do to really continue to engage these kids and do it in such a way that really uh, magnifies the importance of the, them learning something relevant. And now more than anything, they, the, the material that they need to be learning, it really needs to be relevant or the engagement goes away very quickly. So um, uh, that's Definitely. what I would say. And I, think that, and I think that if there is a silver lining is right now, a lot of parents are discovering that it is possible and educators too, but there is possible to customize the education of children. It's just a matter of finding what are the right tools are. And we have the tools at our disposal, which is different from let's say like 20, 30 years ago, right? So I think that it's opening, I think that more educators and more families are realizing the potential in the customization of education, even in a challenging environment like this one that we're going through right now. But the, the question that I had for Jamie, and I think that she already talked a little bit about the question that I had for you is, as parents still scramble to find solutions that can meet the educational need of our children in light of school, of school, in light, for example, school closures and limited options in some, in some states and in some situations, could you share some, some of your experience with trying to address the disruption and with trying to customize the education of your children? What, what has been your path? Great question. Thank you for asking. So, when the disruption occurred with COVID, we had to pivot really quickly. And we have small children, we have you know, elementary age children. And my husband and I have not been involved with the education of our children before. So we had to learn rather quickly, okay, what can we do to enhance their experience at home? And how do we make this easy for them and for us and where do we go and what do we do? So um, I did allude earlier that we did do a lot of research, but we also incorporated a fun element to this where we invited children within the neighborhood that were the same age that they were and they worked together on projects or on quizzes or tests. Um, so that really helped that element of they were still with their peers and they just didn't have to wear a mask. That's how they kind of phrased it. They were like, well, we get to have school too. We just don't have to wear a mask. So they had fun with it. Um, again, it 
there were so many platforms for us to choose from, but for us, we had to find the right ones for our elementary age children. So we did the brick and mortar model, and we also did a digital academy model, and we also did a Florida virtual school model where we subsidized certain programs from all three to make a custom fit for our children. And from that, my children were able to have individual attention to when they were having a problem and then they were able to create a solution to that problem. And so that really helped that they were able to engage with their school teacher. Um, that was the other part of it. We had to hire a school teacher during the day to be here from 8.30 to five because we both worked. And I think that really helped our children too, was to have that person that was able to educate them as well. And that's great. Thank you. Rod, you wanted to say, I saw you there, wanted to say something. I was just gonna say that is so dead on to what we're going through in our, our school and I'm sure across the nation is the, is the importance of connecting to kids when they need it the most and making that connection, whether it be uh, putting, one of the uh, things that I've learned is, is, is being able to put kids in groups that really are working together and then allowing even the kids who are a little bit advanced, allowing them to go in and work with them individually and then taking another group and making their own breakout rooms so that I can travel in one at a time and, and have that privacy that they so demand that when you're on a screen like this, that is not a good time to ask them, you know, uh, raise your hand if you're having a problem. So I, I so agree with what Jamie said, that the connection piece is huge, huge part of uh, making this all work. That's great. Fran, did you want to add something or? Yeah, I agree with um, Rod. We are just all trying to find creative ways to connect with the students because this is all new for us. And it's, it is hard building those relationships virtually. So we all are, out, the educators are being very creative, like you said, with the breakout rooms. Um, sometimes I have to create individual Zoom links just for kids to jump on so we can have a conversation and just figure out what is going on. So it is about building those re relationships virtually. Thank you. So moving on to the next question I have for the group. Let me find it. And uh, I think, Angelette, might be time to, we wanted to show you a video. It's a video, and the person speaking, speaking in the video is Andrea Martinez of Bright Future Academy of Georgia. And I wanted to show you the video and ask you, uh, what are your thoughts in relation to the message that she's delivering in, in that video? Angela, can we, okay, I think it's starting. Uh, a large part of the teacher boot camp is changing mindsets because some teachers have um, underlying biases. They think that certain students can't learn. And it's important for us to understand that all of our students can learn. And, um, if, and there's no one size fits all for education. So we wanna change the teacher's mindset um, so that they understand, for instance, the difference in equity versus e equality. Equality being, you know, everyone gets equal education. Everyone gets the exact same thing. We use the same textbooks. We use the same method of teaching and so forth. But I believe that we should provide equitable services to our students. Equitable services meaning we meet our kids where they are and we teach them what they need to know to be successful um, in an in a equal classroom environment. So in, the, in, in that instance, we're teaching the teachers how to create individualized, uh, individualized student learning plans. So I hope everybody was able to see the video. The question that I had in relation uh, with that video is that, do you agree the, with the message? And do you think that the issue of equity, it's often not analyzed through the lens of personalizing education to meet the individual needs of the student? Um, 
Yes, go ahead. I think it depends on um, the districts. I know uh, for Gwinnett County, we have been the leaders in this area for a while. We have looked at the, um, our communities and created these individual or community academies that help support the communities that we serve. So the students that attend our schools will be able to access different programs. So for example, at my school, we have an entrepreneurship center, a STEM center, a law center, and a media center. So whenever they leave middle school and come um, their ninth grade year, they get to explore all of the different academies and what identifies with them and are they're able to sign up and be a part of something that they actually want to do. And you see a lot of districts moving to that model to help with that individual learning. Thank you. So the, the question that I had for, for the group in relation to what was on the video, and uh, so it's sometimes we're talking about how systems that are designed, one size, one size fits all systems, they leave children behind because they're not, they leave many children behind because they don't really tackle what are their unique needs and talents. So do you think that there, this is the time to rethink what it means, even through the lens of equity, to make sure that all children have an education that is relevant to them, that is customized to their needs? Jamie and, and Rod, do you, do you think that this is where we should be heading? Well, without a doubt, I'll bet, Jamie, I'm sorry, you unmuted, go ahead. No, 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 Rod. Um, all I was going to say was from a parent perspective, one of the things I found when teaching my daughter science, she learned better with hands-on experience. So walking down to the lake and showing her life from, you know, the tadpole to the frog, that worked better for her. And that was a, a way that she could make sense of what was happening in real lifetime. And I think getting out of that classroom setting really does help the children um, understand what is actually happening around them. We actually were in a very interesting time period of when history was being made um, while we were at school, you know, at homeschool, or, you know, and they were able to connect it to say, oh, this is what it all means because we were right in the middle of a big election and they were learning history. So that was, again, another unique opportunity for them to understand and connect it and make sense of, oh, okay, this is why we have President's Day. Oh, okay, this is why you, they live here or this is where they work. So again, that was a very interesting history lesson for them and they enjoyed it immensely. So I think, you know, getting away from the one size fits all is something that we really need to consider um, for educators, especially. And that's been something that I've been very vocal about. Uh, that was well said. Um, I, I want to just mention something. Uh, one of my mentors uh, uh, pointed out some things, and I, I was thinking about uh, when I was kind of come on, I thought, well, I, you know, this is the essence of where I think we do individualize the learning, as the young lady in the video said. And uh, part of that is feeding the child's curiosity, um, being um, interactive, making uh, the learning very interactive. Um, helping the students uh, gain that, I think I'm repeating a lot of Jamie's, ownership of what they're learning. Uh, one of the things that's worked really well for me is gamifying uh, my classroom um, and, and giving the kids ownership of, 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 of rewards and then being able to use those rewards later. Uh, these are the kinds of things that I think individualize what they're learning and make it powerfully uh, relevant. It uh, takes a traditional classroom and really transforms it. That's great. Thank you. And I wanted to follow up with another question for the whole group, uh, which is related to what we've been talking so far, but maybe more, maybe more directly tackling the situation that we are experiencing right now. And the question is this, I think that the current pandemic has highlighted some of the weaknesses of our education system which in many cases has been slow to respond to the challenges of the current pandemic. In line with what we saw in the video, do you think that our rethinking of how we do education and increasing innovation in this space could be the key to increasing the resiliency of the system? 
what are some of the barriers that prevent innovation and a more personalized approach from taking roots, from taking root in education? And how should those barriers be removed? Fran, I would like to start with you. And if you could share your experience with your background, what do you think about, you know, especially if, if whether which weaknesses the current pandemic has exposed, and how can we tackle them? How can we remove the barriers to make sure the children can learn better? I, I would definitely say it just depends on the community that you serve. Um, one of the things that I think everyone experienced um, during the pandemic is um, shedding light on again what was called the digital divide. That was a term that was back in the 90s and 2000s. And so when we got into the pandemic, we had quite a few kids who went home that did not have um, technology. And so you can't teach anything if they don't have the tools that they need in order to um, complete their assignments. And so we definitely um, uh, need to go back to figuring out if all of our kids have the resources. Just because the digital divide stopped trending doesn't mean that it's over. So working with our parents and our community leaders and our business leaders to make sure that our kids have access to the technology that they need to learn. Without that, we can't do any of what we're talking about today in a, in a virtual setting. Thank you. And I think you raised a very, a very important point. Jamie and Francis, do you have some thoughts? And if you want, I can repeat the question. I realize it was a little long. No, no, I uh, I agree with Fran on the digital divide. You know, that was something when we started going into the virtual world, it was, okay, what do we need? And we were able to get the things that we needed for our children, but many families did not have the same resources. And there were neighborhoods that just didn't have internet or access to internet. Um, so it was, it is that digital divide. It is also having access to internet and having free internet in low income neighborhoods that could provide hotspots for the digital space. I mean, those are ways that we should be innovating. We should be looking at uh, repurposing maybe old school buses to become a hub so kids connect to the internet. Um, that's something that we did in our county that was great and it worked really well for the low income neighborhoods, but we should be doing that nationwide for everybody so that they have access to the internet. Um, the other thing that we really should consider maybe versus school books is now that we're going to a digital platform, how do we put that money towards better digital tools, um, digital, digital means, digital just cameras, we need to be thinking about that and looking at the focus of those programs. And I can see in the, in the chat that one of the questions was, and I think we, we have been trying to address it, whether or not we can truly add equity in a virtual environment. This was my biggest struggle with virtual instruction. Rob, did you want to add something to uh, it's hard to add to both Fran and Jamie because they hit the nail on the head and, and, and there's certainly not going to be an easy answer for all those things. But I did want to mention that I think it's really important that, um, that we not uh, skip thinking about how important it is to have good leaders in our uh, educational environment. Um, you know, um, everything rises and falls on leadership and it's so critical to have the people in place that are innovative thinkers, that are willing to sacrifice and move the mountains to get the bus, to get the, uh, to get the training and to have uh, the days off you need to prepare for uh, a very rich and uh, engaging lesson. And um, I think that's something that it should not be overlooked. And I wanted to, I wanted to do a follow-up question. If we, if we look beyond the problem of the connectivity of the digital divide, as we discussed. What are some other barriers that you think are there of any other type that prevent innovation or prevent educators from being innovative in the classroom? The other thing to maybe think about, you know, educators are also maybe parents as well. So they have their own family life to think about as this is all occurring. So they're having to learn new platforms in a very short time period. 
So grace is, you know, a keyword that we used a lot. Um, parents having grace with the educators, the educators having grace with the parents. I mean, we're all in a learning situation trying to learn together. And thankfully, we, we were given a lot of grace during this time period. But it's, it's really, you know, we have to look at what our educators are also going through at home and how can we work with them to break those barriers because they are also there to teach, but they also have a personal life as well. So that was a big barrier um, for somebody as an educator. Fran, did you want to add something? To the something? only thing I can say is um, I understand even with Jamie being a parent, I think that we, this pandemic has um, definitely helped us to build better relationships with the parents. And I think that must continue on as we move forward, even when we get back to business as normal, if that even is a thing. I think we still need to continue to build those relationships with the parents. Parents have really be become that extra support for teachers. Um, I'm a teacher and a parent, and so you know, being at home, helping my child, understanding what she's doing, giving her the support um, is definitely, you know, something that's been added to my plate. But I have definitely been making those relationships with with those with her teachers. And I think um, you're going to see more schools uh, create programs and classes and maybe even some Saturday. I think we've, we've done a few Saturday classes with our parents to help them understand the technology, help them understand how to use the apps that we're asking them to, asking the students to use. They're kind of like our, they're, they're backing us up at home. Yeah. And I really, really appreciate that. And so we're gonna have to still continue to build those relationships with the parents and help them to support their kid at home. That, that's a very insightful answer. And I think you hit the nail on something that I, I wanted to ask you about the, so this idea of educators and families working together to find a solution for their children. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the current standardized way, uh, traditional way of doing education is in itself a barrier for that collaboration? Do you, do you think that this, the way the schools work, the traditional model of schooling uh, is a barrier to that? And how can we change the workings of the current system to make that collaboration easier between educa educators and families? I think you're starting to see more schools move away from the traditional model. And I, those schools that are doing that, they're tapping into their, um, uh, their kind of like their community leaders, their business leaders, having those conversations, inviting them, the parents, uh, to the table and, and asking, what is it that you want to see out of the school? How is it that you, how do you want your child to be educated? What programs do you want us to have? Those conversations need to continue on and that develops your school. Um, that creates the space that parents are willing to send their kid to this school because they know that their kid is getting exactly what they, they you know, asked for. So I think that you're gonna continue to see those relationships with schools and all the stakeholders that are in that community to, and you're gonna see less of a traditional model. Um, uh, and that's, what, that's how I feel about it, yeah. Thank you. So it seems that it, from what you're saying, it seems that to me that schools educators, they're realizing the potential of a more, a more personalized approach to education. And, and I think that that can increase collaboration between educators and families, because it means moving away from a standardized system to a customized one. And I think the experience of Jamie, for example, I think you have lived it. You're, you have experienced the benefits of customization. And what do you think are some of the barriers that should be lifted within the system of education as it exists today to, for more and more families to join you on that path of customization? Well, the biggest barrier, first off, you know, to do the plan that we had done is going to be making sure that they can financially do that. Not everybody can afford to have a school teacher at home to do this while they both parents work at home or one parent works. Um, if it's a single parent household, it's just too much. 
um, financially. And we thankfully were blessed to do that. Um, that is one barrier. The, the other barrier is that you need to be able to have honest communications with your educators and administrators and sit down at the table together and work and collaborate and be innovative together. Um, if you are closed off to the conversation, then you're not going to have a fruitful conversation and that creates a barrier. Thank you. And Rob, did you wanna share your thoughts on this as well? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Having, uh, having an environment where you, you couldn't talk to the administration about issues is really, um, uh, Pat Lincioni mentions that in one of his books that uh, it, is, it is not a healthy environment. And, and most importantly, it's not one that really fosters innovation, which is what exactly we're talking about today is making these changes in an environment that is, that is so needed right now. And so I can't, um, I can't emphasize enough that uh, having that, that, that strong leadership to come alongside these teachers and go, you have a unique situation in, you, in, in, this, in this role, whether it be what you're teaching or the amount of kids or even when you're doing it, uh, all of those things mix in. So I think it's really important to make sure that communication is open and it, and it, and it happens often. Thank you. And I wanted to move on to the next question, but I think that we always <laughs> tackle the next question before it's time. I think we talked about a little bit about this, but Jamie, this is a question that I had for you. Because of your, your particular experience, you might have an interesting insight. I wanted to ask you if for you to continue on with your current educational arrangements, uh, is the lack of funding options uh, a barrier that prevents more families from taking a similar path? And I, and I think that you, uh, you mentioned this right now. So what can we do? Is, is it a problem with the not a lot of flexibility built into uh, education funding? Is it that type of problem that prevents more options from taking root? Yes. And, you know, when looking back on it, you know, if the money had followed the child, we would have been able to do more, I think, and we would have been able to do more within our community. Um, however, the money does not follow the child. So that creates a barrier for us. And so I, of course, would love to see the money follow the child. So therefore these barriers could be broken and more innovation could take place. Thank you. And I, and I think that this is something that, so what you're saying is that it's not always the system is not always built for funding to follow the child. So, and it's, and it's difficult to use the, the funding towards different options. So that's, that's one barrier that I think should be lifted or the system should be ameliorated in that direction. That is correct. And I think that would allow parents to have a customized plan and then we can get away from the one size fits all. And then parents are able to really work with their children because all parents want to be there for their children. It's just what we want to do and who we want to be. Um, however, when we have barriers in front of us, it, it makes it hard. I see. Thank you. And Rob, do you also think that the, the, there isn't a lot of flexibility built into, and, and you know, we don't really have a system where money follows the child. So it's also, is, is that also being your experience yeah, I'm afraid that's exactly true. Um, we uh, started, I, I have four children, and we started off our children in private school, and uh, that worked uh, real well for a little while, and uh, then um, it got very expensive, so then we brought them home and, and homeschooled, and, and that worked well also for some, and each child is different, uh, but uh, it was uh, a trying time to 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 get all the funds needed to uh, do what we wanted to, whether it be private school or even homeschool. So it was not easy uh, for my family uh, being a one income family, uh, but that's what we really wanted. That's, that's where we, we thought we should do. So uh, fortunately we were able to kind of tighten the belt, but not every family, not many families can just easily do that. Um, so I agree, Jamie, this is a tough situation. Frank, yeah. did you, do you, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I agree with them as well. It's hard um, when the money does not follow the child. 
and you want to create those experiences for your child. And I would say, look to different. Um, for me, if my kid is not getting what I want them to get in, in their school situations, so I will look for other resources. Definitely look to your nonprofit organizations um, to find out what they can do to supplement those activities and those experience that your, your school is not providing. Um, and that's what I've been doing. Thank you. Okay, so I think we are at time to read some of the questions from the audience. And so one question that I wanted to direct, direct the group is, do you believe that the current shift towards virtual learning over the last, over the last year could lead to a bigger push for year-round year -round school? wants to tackle this question first? <laughs> I, I will try. So um, virtual learning over the last year could possibly lead to a bigger push for year round school, but there's, it depends on how you do that too, as well. You can't do that eight hours a day. Um, you can break it down to probably three or four hours of the day. And then therefore, you know, then you have the year round school, but do educators really want to teach for a year round either. That's the other part of that is, you know, do educators have the time to teach, learn the program, stay on top of what is happening virtually. Um, so there, there is a little bit of a barrier there. So I don't necessarily know if it will tackle into a year round program, but the only way you could do that is if you shorten the education time um, to three or four hours a day. I like that. I'm, I'm voting for Jamie. <laughs> she has my vote. You know, I, I, I'll let Fran jump in here in a second, but I'm telling you, um, it is easy to be burned out when you are working on grading uh, research papers or whatever it is you're doing and it's late at night. And that goes on month after month. There's, there's some lull time, but not many. And it is, it is hit the ground running in August and uh, you know, you are whooped in May. So you are so right, Jamie. There would have to be some major modifications. Like uh, I can see a three-week hiatus in, in the fall and four weeks in December. I mean, it just would, you would have to have some modifications. What do you think, Fran? <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I don't know if it'll, it's going to be a big push for year round, but I do think it will be virtual learning has created that space where we will see more schools being prepared for emergencies. You'll see more schools having more digital learning days built into their schedules and their calendars. Um, that's what I see. Just to add to that also, you know, one of the things that to take into consideration when teachers are doing the classroom digitally, they are also answering emails, answering text messages, answering phone calls from parents, doing Zoom meetings while all of this is occurring. Um, you know, we, we heard it from the brick and mortar teachers and, you know, how, and then they have to go home and they're working till 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night with their own families. So again, taking into account that I don't think that it can be a year round, but you have to modify the day. Yeah, that makes sense. And the, the other question that I had is for Rob. Um, could you give us an example of how you have innovated in the classroom? Oh, wow. Um, uh, several ways. I, I think maybe one of the things, and this will speak towards some of the things that Fran's doing, uh, and that is pulling in community members and uh, from across the country. In fact, I've got people coming in sometimes from California and Boston, and they come right into my Zoom room, right, from their office, uh, and they do these real live activities with the kids. I teach a personal finance course through a Dave Ramsey uh, curriculum. And um, I tell the kids at the end of the uh, capstone unit, I say, okay, hey, uh, you guys are going to be guest host on the radio show. And we're going to have people come into our, our Zoom classroom and are going to ask you scenarios about some of the things you've learned. And uh, that was absolutely uh, fun, engaging. We had 
people from, like I said, for, from across the country. That doesn't happen in, in a in a uh, real classroom. At least, well, well, if you're, yeah, you know, obviously, if you're across the country, uh, but that's that's just one example. Thank you, Rob. And let me let me see. We have, I think we have another question that I want. Oh, go yeah. ahead, go ahead, Jenny. We got to see from the elementary side when the children were get, getting burned out very quickly. Um, the teacher would do a disco dance party via Zoom. So for elementary age children, that was the best, right? Um, that they could do this disco party with their friends and they thought it was fun. The other way was a connection for our kindergartner was he had lunch Zooms. And so with other kindergartners, and he thought it was just the greatest thing because mommy's on a Zoom, he's on a Zoom. So <laughs> he, he loved it. He called it his little business meetings he had to go to. Um, and then the other thing that we also saw was that the teacher would if a child was doing well in the classroom, in the third grade classroom, she would actually ask that child to have lunch with her via Zoom. And those are ways that they connected, that she could connect with the child. And those were just some innovative ways that we saw from an elementary um, school that they were trying to connect with the parents digitally. And then the principal would do lunch Zooms with the parents to ask us what our thoughts were. What is working? What is not working? What can we modify? What do we need to scale back on? And this occurred every nine weeks. And that was a very innovative approach to a principal having the parents at the table. That's great. And for me, my classroom space is um, more of a collaboration space. I do not have a traditional classroom. And so my students have, before the pandemic, they had access to all types of equipments from 3D printers to virtual reality, you name it, we got it. And so when we became virtual, I still had to create that experience for the kids. And so um, I teach entrepreneurship and those students needed to still build their models, their business models or their products. So they use Tinkercad to build those um, models. And so I now do this, let's go live and watch your um, product being printed on your on 3D printer. So even though they're not there, they can still see um, their models being built and they enjoy that. So just little things like that make the difference for the students. Yeah, those seems pretty big, big things. <laughs> it's amazing what you're doing. And yeah, I, let me I mention one see. more, one more quick yeah. thing that that was absolutely a huge hit. I never really uh, was able to figure out how to teach the kids interview skills until I figured out, hey, I can have the kids uh, block off ten minute slots. Um, and they could do an interview right on Zoom, and then the next kid come right on. And I did that over a one-week span and, and filled up, obviously, a lot of my time in the evening. But boy, was that a great way for me to teach interview skills. And the kids dressed up. I you know, gave them a little bit of an outline of what they needed to do. But boy, was that a lot of fun. I got to know the kids really well, and they shined on those interviews uh, right there on Zoom. And I would have never thought of doing that um, uh, you know, away from school, the way I was doing it, and they did it right from their home. It was just, it just worked out really well. That that's great. I mean, it's 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 impressive to see how, like, there are so many new things that can, so new ways of doing education that can be implemented, and I, and I think that the individuals that have the creativity to do it today have an opportunity to do it. Even, even with the challenges that we're experiencing, which is not easy. I think it's a, technology has allowed for a lot more things that we can do in line with what Fran was saying, for example. And I had a question, um, I, had a, I had a question kind of related to this um, that our audience wanted to ask. And uh, I don't know if you wanna answer this, Fran, it's thoughts on a system that rewards teachers for going the extra mile. And I think, and I think I would say, maybe a system that rewards uh, creativity and innovation. So, what are your thoughts? How can we help help educators um, innovate and at the same time being rewarded for that innovation? Um, definitely. Um, what we do is kind of 
these teacher spotlights. Teachers are, they're doing a lot of work, a lot of things behind the scene. And I think sometimes it's just one of those things they just want to make they, they just want to know that you care, especially with Rod was saying with the leadership team, do you care? Do you see, you know? And so we spotlight our teachers um, uh, for all the innovation that they're doing. We allow, we let parents know, we, pro we promote that through our social media. We reward them for those different things that they're doing in the classroom. And so that's just that we appreciate you. Um, there, there's times in, for my school when they come, when our teachers come, we'll have little uh, tokens of appreciation in their boxes, just surprising them um, and appreciating all the stuff, the hard work that they're doing. And it, it doesn't even have to be a big thing, just something small to let them know that you care. I think that's that's really interesting, and uh, and I think that the current situation that we are experiencing it has been an eye opening on the work that educators do and how hard it is and how much they put their heart into what they're doing. So that that might be the silver lining coming out of just all of these challenges. Do you, do you guys agree? I think that we all have a newfound uh, appreciation for how difficult and you know it is to. So I'm smiling here because uh, before when I would order, you know, teacher stuff from Amazon, my husband's like, you know, go light on it, you know, don't order, order too much. And now he's like, order whatever the teacher needs for the classroom, <laughs> like go big and order the whole wish list. So, <laughs> so that's what we've been doing because we appreciate how much hard work goes into the lives. And so that is what we've been doing to show our appreciation is, you know, we've gone big with that Amazon wish list. <laughs> yeah. I, I, let me just say one quick thing, and that is our uh, our administration has been over and above. Uh, one of the first things they did that just shocked me is that uh, back when the pandemic started in March, a uh, few, um, I guess, a few weeks later, maybe a month later, I go out to the mailbox and walk out to the mailbox and what's sitting right beside my mailbox, a sign that said, we love our teachers. Uh, and I thought, oh my word, what a great way to just say, thank you. They yeah. drove to every single house and put a sign up to all 135 teachers. Uh, and a lot of uh, wow. schools did that. That was a huge, huge uh, fell at my heart. It was really wonderful. And they've, and they've continued to do things just like that. So. It's been really nice. And some schools have been creative with even opening that up for parents. I get an email every week um, from my child's school to, can you, you know, and this is sent out to all the parents. Can you highlight a teacher? Can you tell us what a teacher is doing that's good that you like? And we will um, shout them out during the uh, faculty meeting. And I'm like, that is so creative. And so you fill out this little Google form with the teacher's name and what, how, why you appreciate it. And then they are acknowledged at their next faculty meeting. And that was from a parent. So I, I, I love stuff like that. Being creative during these times is just, is definitely needed. Certainly, Th thank you, friend. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Jamie, I had a question for you. Um, I think many people are asking this. Um, related to homeschooling and teaching children from home, would you share um, some of the hints of the research uh, that you did to help children learn from home or the program you're using? Sure. So you're going to you're going to laugh, but you know, what better way to find your answers than go to your Facebook and your social media and just start asking questions. Um, everybody starts, you know, it's on there for a reason and I just went to different mom groups across the states. Um, I went from a Peloton moms group to a NordaTrack moms group. Uh, to a boot camp mom's group. I mean, I was all over the place just asking questions on social media, asking what works, what doesn't work, what do you like? And I found that once I got out of my comfort zone, asking questions opened up a plethora of other questions from other parents. And we were starting to engage and having more fruitful conversations at the table of how we can innovate together. 
um, and what worked, what didn't work. Um, so I'm going to say, start with your social media and go from there and don't be afraid to ask a question because I guarantee you there's somebody else who has the same question, but they're probably too afraid to ask that question. And then if you don't get an answer from there, go to your educators, go to your administrators. Um, I just started talking to everybody and anyone who would just listen to me. And I don't think, I think maybe it's because I was stuck at home with three other people and a puppy. So I was just like, here, I've got, I've got a voice, uh, hear me. But once again, once I got out of my comfort zone, I just started doing a lot of online research on Facebook, um, Instagram, every social media platform really has a mom's group out there. And I would say connect with them, um, connect with your teachers. And then from there, you're able to build what works best for you and your family. And then don't be afraid if you fail. That's the other big thing. If you fail, learn, just move on and innovate again. Um, that was something that we had to do. We failed, we innovated and we transformed. So that was really big for us. Thank, thank you, Jamie. I, I, I think what you're doing is really inspiring. I think what all of you guys are doing is really inspiring and trying to be creative. And this notion of trying and exploring new options, I think is very important. I think we're at a time where we probably need this injection of creativity and trying what we're, and find out what works best for children. I think that all of you are doing that. So thank you so much for your service. Thank you. And I think that we're almost at time. I see Angelette. Uh, not even. <laughs> so, it's time. <laughs> it's a rare time, and we want to be respectful of, every, of everyone's time. And so, I thank you, thank you all so much for sharing your experiences, thoughts, and ideas. I think this is this has been great. And I, again, I thank you all of you for your creativity and, and willingness to share what you're doing, so the children can continue to learn, even in this challenging environment. Thank you again. Yeah, I want to thank you guys. Um, and Jamie, you you actually made a really great point at the very end about seeking answers through social media platforms. I just want to add that there is a Facebook group page called Learn Everywhere. And it is, I don't, I think there's like 20,000 or more people on this group page, um, where it consists of parents, educators, and homeschoolers that are sharing that kind of knowledge. So that is one one place people can start looking for some answers. Um, and, and again, thanks for joining us, everyone that's watching, for our panelists, for Valerio, who I haven't seen in person in like a year. And um, I just wanna say this is just the beginning and we look forward to providing more opportunities like this where we can all collaborate in open conversations to find innovative solutions in education. So please stay connected with us by commenting in the chat below. You can keep chatting there. Um, this will be live on YouTube forever. Um, and in addition to those who registered, you will receive a survey to help us come up with other opportunities um, to have these conversations. There is also a link to a survey in the chat below. So take a look at that. In the meantime, we hope everyone enjoys the rest of the week and the end of January.